this program I developed for a course I taught in, at the, in Boston, at the Boston Architectural School, and it was really something I never expected to do twice. It was uh, in the preservation program there, and the purpose was to uh, introduce the students to uh, what, what I think historic preservation means and one, one of the ways that one can, can do that and, and, and care about it. It's a little bit too much about me, but you'll see that it's also about here. So I think you'll hopefully enjoy it. Despite spending the bulk of my career in museum work, the wave I rode in on was historic preservation, which was taking off in a big way in the 1970s when I was in high school and college and coincided with the ramp up to the bicentennial, an era of reform and job formation in the museum industry, expansion of the antiques industry, and heightened interest in state and local history. I was living in Vermont then, a state that had had no growth from the time of the Civil War, which meant everything around me was old. <laughs> D discovering that history wasn't just in books, but all around us seemed as profound a realization then as it does today. I studied local history and architectural history, practically living in the remarkable local history museum in the town in Vermont where I attended college. Uh, preservation matters. I was fortunate enough to make a career out of it and am, of course, still at it today. Preservation, saving and calling attention to places and things worth caring about, has been my life's work and every day brings uh, fresh reasons to care. That picture above there, I, I took that picture sat at a museum in Washington, D.C. that no longer exists. It was called the Museum and it was all about you know, newspapers. And I love that. There are three kinds of people who run toward disaster, not away. Cops, firemen, and reporters. And I would add preservationists, and we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get to how that works. But um, uh, so I thought I would kick this off by talking about the history of history, how uh, Americans got interested and self-conscious about the past, and it goes way, way back. It starts with what I call literary antiquarianism, uh, which is, well, excuse me, with, well, art. This is John Trumbull on the upper left, who was the son of Connecticut's governor and one of America's first you know, professional artists. And he did lots of historical paintings uh, in the rotunda at the Capitol, at Yale Art Gallery at Wadsworth Athenaeum, and he went around and tracked down all the, a lot of the founding fathers, including Oliver Ellsworth, and did their portraits because he felt that the revolution was an epic in world history that needed to be recorded. Then there's what I call literary antiquarianism. Longfellow, Hawthorne, Whittier, James Fenimore Cooper, Henry David Thoreau, Harriet Beecher Stowe, literature saturated with memory and national reflection, and there was a lot of that. This is all before, not all of it, most of it before the Civil War. Then in the 1850s, a group of women got together and decided to form a national organization, which is astonishing all by itself, to save George Washington's Mount Vernon, which was uh, threatened, really, in, in the 1850s. Mount Vernon Ladies Association did that. Then the centennial in 1876 came along, the, by, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the country, and that triggered a, another round of what I would call historicism, interest in history and preservation and saving things. And on the lower left there is actually the Connecticut building at the Centennial Fairgrounds, and actually on the upper left is the interior of it, where they had a, you can't really, well you can kind of see it, it's down in this corner, it's a little wooden ham uh, made out of wood of the charter oak. Uh, we won't try to explain that, but that's what they liked. Uh, then in the 1890s, organizations like the Daughters of the American Revolution were founded, and they really kicked it into overdrive. And I hope some of you have been to uh, Constitution Hall, the museum of the DAR in Washington. It's my favorite museum in Washington. They do great exhibitions. They have great stuff, and they've been around a long time. And the DAR also has... Uh, properties here and there. This is the uh, uh, 
Governor Trumbull House in Lebanon, Connecticut, that is a DAR property. Then there are the Colonial Dames, founded about the same time, and they have house museums and properties. Stanton on the upper left in Philadelphia and the Webb House in Wethersfield on the lower left. Uh, and the Colonial Dames were the first to do a survey of Connecticut architecture. And this is in like the 1909, 1910. Uh, they had to practically go around with horses and buggies because most people didn't own automobiles at that time. But this series, which is uh, preserved at the State Library, was the first effort to really dig deep into the history of architecture of Connecticut. Then there were these women leaders in Annapolis, Charleston, Philadelphia, and Savannah. A lot of our early preservation organizations were founded by these groups of women here and there, and they did amazing work saving things and, and underscoring the importance of them. Uh, historic New England, originally known as the Society for Preservation of New England Antiquities, was founded in 1909 in Boston and they uh, had, were involved in preservation, published this uh, journal, Old Time New England, for decades, published just hundreds of articles about aspects of New England architecture and uh, material culture and history. And uh, they uh, were involved in scholarship, also activism. And then there are these folks. These are some of my heroes. Uh, Cummings Davis on the upper on the left, upper left, George Sheldon on the upper right, and Henry Sheldon in the center. Henry Sheldon founded the Sheldon Museum in Middlebury, Vermont, where I uh, attended college. And by the beginning of my junior year, the curator there that was it's a little it's not a little, but it's it, they had like a part time director, curator did everything uh, person in, in those days. And she got so tired of me constantly calling and asking, when will we, can I get in and look at the archives? This is amazing. My junior year, they said, yeah, wouldn't it be just easier for all of us if you had a key? <laughs> <laughs> and that worked out. It really changed my life. Great place. And then just others like um, John Warner Barber of New Haven on the left and uh, Isaac Stewart of Hartford. These were pre-Civil War era. Connecticut historians who really helped lay the tracks, lay the groundwork for an interest in all, all this stuff. Uh, Emily Holcomb, one of my heroes, we were just talking about the barn, the, the Wadsworth barn in Lebanon that was moved to Lebanon by Catherine Day. There are two women here, uh, uh, Emily Holcomb on the upper left and Catherine Day on the right, upper right, lower right, and a portrait of her in the kind of right center. Uh, she uh, uh, saved, uh, helped save the Trumbull House in Lebanon, saved the Mark Twain and the Harriet Beecher Stowe House, which has, for better or for worse, the biggest endowment of any house museum in America. I mean, they're, it's beyond rich. Anyway, uh, Emily Holcomb saved the ancient burying ground, the old state house. Catherine Day, somebody should write a book on her. She actually stood up to death threats. People threatened to kill her if she didn't knock it off. Uh, and she never knocked it off because, well, she was rich and she could get away with not knocking it off. But she was amazing. And I love her. And then my hero of all, uh, all above all, is George Dudley Seymour of New Haven, uh, 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 about whom I speak. And he, he was a one-man preservation society uh, who wrote books and just he did so many different things. Uh, it, I mean, this seems a little nutty. He was really fascinated with architectural architects. Early, the early builders and architects in Connecticut. He wrote books about them. Mounted an exhibit at the Mattituck Museum in Waterbury in the 1920s about David Hoadley, and got into this snit because the Brick Center Church in New Haven had been painted white. And that was not the original intent. And, and you know the people in the parish and the minister and all like probably thought he was a screwball. But he advocated for removing the white and restoring the purity of its original design. And he did originally, uh, eventually prevail. He also brought Frederick Law Olmsted 
and cast Gilbert into a relationship with New Haven to do a city plan. In 1910, he was involved in city planning and was a counselor to the colonial dames in their old housing survey. And amazingly, nobody was thinking this way in 1910. He, um, uh, when buildings were coming down, when old built houses were coming down in New Haven, he paid a photographer to go in and document them, at least before they were destroyed. And uh, so he, he, he really was a one-man preservation society who also wound up buying and preserving the Nathan Hale Homestead. And it was one of the first house museums in Connecticut out there in Coventry. And uh, the Na thousand acre Nathan Hale Forest, that's a whole lo longer story that surrounds it. It's a very, very special place. Uh, then there was Wallace Nutting, who uh, I first, when I first moved to Connecticut, I was doing research on Wallace Nutting for Wadsworth Athenaeum, and he was um, a, also one-man preservation society. He wrote books, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, all the state's beautiful series. He wrote the most popular, successful books ever on the history of antiques, and then he did these incredible photographs, creating these colonial interiors that were really sort of stage sets, but he was a, really quite famous in the 1920s and 30s. And he assembled what he called a chain of picture houses. And this is in the 19 teens, long before house museums were a thing uh, 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 of any regularity. He had half a dozen of them, including the Webb House in Wethersfield. And then on the lower left here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and the lower right in Saugus, Mass. And then there was Jackie Kennedy, who turned the White House into a house museum. Decorative arts movement and the preservation and a preservation activist. And those of you, us old enough to remember uh, the, what was it, Vaughn Mader, the record about the, the, the satire on her tour of the White House. Well, she was really involved in the preservation and furnishing of the White House and making sure people understood that it was more than just a house for a temporary occupant called president. And she, her legacy in preservation is, she, because she's so big in so many other ways, is kind of underreported. Well, my on-ramp into all of this stuff, I was a student in Vermont in the six, from 1969 till 1980, and I went to this little school up in Saxons River, and I could ride my bike three and a half miles up the road to the Rockingham Meeting House, which is a national historic landmark. It blew my mind as a 14-year-old, and it blows my mind today. It's a national treasure. And this is how I started in the early 70s, getting interested in preservation. That's me with long hair in my dorm room uh, at Middlebury College, and I've got it's 1973, and I've got a gravestone rubbing in green on the left, a map of Vermont, or no, of Addison County, so because I didn't want to get lost, and of course my tie dies. So that's the way. And apples that I, a lot of apples in Addison County, Vermont. So, uh, and I just got really into it, um, uh, architecture and cycling around. Eventually, I had a car, so I'd go a little farther. But um, in 1974, uh, I had a friend who was a photography. Uh, art student, and we, he, I was learning photography. We went on a four-week road trip, all around, did 5,000 miles all around Vermont, taking pictures of architecture, meeting people, and these are some of the pictures from that 1974 trip, long, long, almost half a century ago at this point. But at this point, I was pretty addicted, and uh, at the my sophomore year, this fellow was my mentor, Glenn Andrus, who was a taught the history of architecture at Middlebury and was a preservation activist and an inspiration and mentor and still 50, almost 50 years later, a dear friend, uh, somebody who influenced me greatly. Uh, and that's me again on the lo lower right. Um, a, a classmate and I, Scott on the left and I, in 1975 and six, organized these walking tours of the town during the foliage season. This was really my first foray into public programming, and it was really successful. People turned out, and we got help them. Our two-hour long march around Middlebury with books and things you could point out was 
I enjoyed doing them. I don't think anybody ever walked off a tour because they were bored, but this is the beginning of what became uh, kind of my life's work. The same guy, Scott and I, in 1975, as a winter term project, did a photojournalistic essay of the town of Rockingham, Vermont. We spent seven days living outdoors in the winter in a cabin um, and walking on foot all day just taking photographs. And, and we did some things that, in hindsight, the lower right and the lower left are pictures inside the paper mills in Bellows Falls. And little did I know at the time, probably nobody ever photographed the inner workings of these mills before. And a couple of years later, it would have been too late. These mills, both there were two of them, both closed down. So that was uh, the beginning. And, and the Arch Bridge, which was the famous landmark in Bellows Falls, was demolished in the early 80s. So I guess there's a moral in that story. And then the bicentennial rolled around. And it, you know, it was, uh, again, those who were there remember a lot of kitschy souvenirs and sort of crap, you know, and it was, it, was it serious? I don't know. But I liked it. I liked the focus on history. And I think that if you were to do a media search of that time, you'd find that it, the, the newspapers and magazines were ablaze with history. And uh, I am all for that, of course. Uh, the next summer, 19, well, that summer, 1976, I was uh, applied for and was accepted into this Deerfield Summer Fellowship Program, which I think more than anything changed my life because um, after that I realized through the 10 weeks I spent in Deerfield as a student that summer that, um, that there was a whole world of people that did this kind of thing and you, you could maybe make a little bit of a living doing it. Uh, I, I did, uh, and uh, it's been great, and Deerfield uh, is fascinating. That summer, Peter, Peter Spang, who's in the middle on the picture, and he's now deceased, but the late Peter Spang, who for 60 years worked at historic Deerfield. He was hired in the 1950s by, uh, after graduating from Harvard. Uh, he was hired by the Flints, who were building this thing, and for 35, 40 years was the, basically their only employee. And um, he, uh, I was doing a project about Asher Benjamin, I won't get into it, but Asher, Abbott Lowell Cummings, who was the, then the director of the Society for Preservation of New England Antiquities, had written his dissertation on Asher Benjamin. Peter Spang thought we ought to meet and dragged me down to a lunch in Boston and I got to sit next to he was one of the, he was a genius and one of the most inspirational figures that the history biz ever produced. And um, I, I, he's also now gone, but loved him. And uh, my finally, my senior year, I did an a independent study of an, a builder, architect from, actually grown up in, uh, or it started out in um, Tolland, Connecticut and then moved to Vermont in 1805 to build this incredible meeting house, spent the rest of his years there. And I did a study of a country builder, somebody in Vermont who was doing that kind of work. After college, I got a job working for the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation, minimum wage, but I was thrilled to be doing something in what became sort of my field. And I worked for a year doing this, and I did survey work for the Vermont Register of Historic Places and put 15 Vermont towns on the state register. And there's no better way to learn about architecture than just looking at what's there, not reading books, but actually studying the stuff as it, as it was. And I saw some amazing things and loved that year. It was, uh, I say, best job I ever had in many ways. Um, uh, then in 1978, I had a job putting the Shaker Complex in Enfield, New Hampshire on the Historic American Building Survey. I was part of a Historic American Building Survey team and I, hadn't, I was just about to head off to graduate school. That same summer, I, 1978, I did uh, research and wrote, gave my first public presentation at a, like a conference, the Dublin Seminar, on the Rockingham, Vermont Stonecutters, a whole topic unto itself, but I love this stuff and I was at this point deep into gravestone studies. 
uh, went off to graduate school in Delaware at the Winter Tour Museum and wrote my thesis on Asher Benjamin again, who I'd been interested in from the Deerfield days, but his work and uh, in Windsor, Vermont. I did a town study of one, the town of Windsor, Vermont, which in 1800 was the largest, richest town in Vermont and had all kinds of great stuff going on. Then, after graduate school, I had the opportunity I, uh, to, to go here to Wadsworth Athenaeum. And it, amazingly, it started out as a summer job, uh, and uh, at the end, at end of August, I was still searching, hoping to go back to Vermont and searching for a job after graduate school. And August rolled around. My boss said, look, your, your project, you're doing well. Why don't you stick? Can you stick around through the fall, which I did, and my boss then quit in October, and, which is sort of dumb luck, but I slotted into a temp adjunct position, and it doesn't matter, but there I was, and I spent 17 years at my summer job. Uh, <laughs> but I did a lot more than Wallace Nutting, and, but that's where I started, was researching um, a Wallace Nutting uh, collection, the largest collection of 17th and early 18th century furniture in the country, and a really a fascinating person. Uh, the uh, collection, we installed it in 1984, and lots of great stuff. Again, Wallace Nutting was a photographer and a writer and um, a house museum operator and a collector. And, um, and during that summer, this is where it connects with right here. Uh, I thought I was, it was a summer job and I was not gonna be here long. And so I really wanted to see as much of Connecticut as I could on my weekends off. And um, I knew about Aleflet Chapin and Daniel Burnap. In fact, they were two of my favorite stories, personalities, craftsmen, and actually Abner Reed. I knew about these three from graduate school. I thought, well, gosh, they were from East Windsor Hill. I got to find that place. And you'll all be amused. You'll understand this perfectly. I went to East Windsor and couldn't find it. <laughs> and there's no sign that tells you that the original center of East Windsor is now in South Windsor. And if you're confused, everyone's confused. But I did eventually get here. And, um, and I saw this. And I just, my head exploded. I thought, oh my god. Where is this? And of course, your whole main street here is a national treasure. And I uh, knocked on it, as I was wont to do after my years in Vermont, I knocked on a door next door. I said, who lives there? Who owns that? Who do I, how do, I would love to meet the person who owns it, maybe get a look inside. And uh, they gave me Carol Burden's name. And I called her. And eventually, she put me in touch with her mother, Hildred Raymond. And um, it's the damnedest thing. I must have had four long phone calls with Hildred Raymond before she invited me to the house. We would talk on the phone. She knew I was at Wadsworth. She knew what I, was, what I wanted. And, and I think she kind of liked the attention or something. But uh, she eventually gave me what I wanted, but I didn't go away. And I'll uh, explain that. We became really good friends. And well, the Watson House is also a national treasure. And there's Hildred and her uh, other great friend, Doris Bergdorf. And in the back picture there, Dean Zarafis, Dr. Dean Zarafis. And uh, these three became my closest friends during my early, early years. I didn't know anybody when I moved to Connecticut. And uh, the, some of the people I knew didn't interest me very much, but, <laughs> but they did. And Hildred Raymond and Doris Bergdorf had the most innate, natural, organic preservation instincts of anyone I ever knew. Hildred just lived for this stuff. And she, I guess, decided that I was maybe the real deal or something, so she indulged me, and we really became very close friends, and I still regret that her uh, decline into Alzheimer's or what it was took almost the last 10 years of her life away from us, but uh, she was an amazing person, and Doris is an amazing person, and Dean Therapies, I, I love them. And uh, then in 83, 
I did what is still the coolest program I've ever been involved with, which was this interpreting a community through its artifacts. I went back to Vermont, got my professor and Scott Morrison, the guy I'd done those projects with, and others, and we did a two and a half day intensive uh, program about learning to understand, to see, and to appreciate the, uh, the architecture and cultural material of the community. And uh, it was great. Then at some point, I guess, I forget what year, maybe around 84 or 5, uh, the ancient burying ground in Hartford uh, was embarking on a big restoration project. And I had sort of a side gig that I did at nights and on weekends helping them. The director of the Athenaeum strongly encouraged me to get involved in this. He knew I was into gravestones. And we wound up raising a million dollars for restoration work there. And I got a book out of it. And um, I don't know, it was just a great project. And uh, it needed everything. And that's a whole other topic for another day. But gravestones, cemetery restoration, I should just add that during the pandemic, it's a little crazy. My wife, who some of you know was formerly the director of the Windsor Historical Society, retired days before the pandemic started. So talk about good timing. So now we're home full time. And what do we do? We spent 100 days uh, doing visiting graveyards and cemeteries. Took 8,000 photographs. Um, and it's the best object-related project I've ever done. And, Maybe another time we could talk about some of the restoration possibilities. That, by the way, on the upper right is the book about the ancient burying ground. And we did some programs and activities. And it was, you know, I just love this stuff. The Association for Gravestone Studies. I was one of the founding members and helped lead a couple tours that they did during their conferences. All this, most of this time, I was working on an exhibition at Wadsworth called The Great River that opened in 1985, and it was for Connecticut's 350th, and it was uh, big is not necessarily better. It was the biggest exhibition ever mounted at Wadsworth Athenaeum, and it was, uh, you know, we got money from various sources, and it was a pretty epic project that involved a large team of scholars and volunteers, researchers, and uh, we visited every town in the Connecticut Valley, every historical society, 140 private homes and collections. Um, and it was pretty amazing. And we got lots of media coverage. This is our Connecticut. And this was you know, partly through Deerfield, partly through my Windsor, Vermont survey, uh, excuse me, graduate thesis, and just partly because the stuff here is so great. Um, you know, the Connecticut River Valley was the place I chose to do what I do. And uh, I have no regrets, although there are days I wish Hartford would get its act together, but we'll leave that for another day. Uh, the, the exhibit was pretty, pretty big, and, and, it, and it included, it took me years to realize that this sort of preservation instinct was pretty fundamental to everything I did, even as a museum person. I was organizing programs and exhibits designed to get people to care about stuff they could maybe have an influence in saving. And uh, th these are just some pictures of that exhibit from 1985. And at the end of the show, this is complicated, but this room in Middletown, uh, the owners had been coy. I hadn't even gotten to see the room. Uh, we wanted to include it in the book, but we anyway, they were being difficult. And it turned out the people who owned this house, the Seth Wetmore house in Middletown, we're gearing up to sell the room out of the house, which is sounds crazy, but they had Sotheby's and the Metropolitan Museum of Art bearing down, wanting very much to buy this. And uh, I think it was one of the cool things I ever did, really, which was persuading them to sell it, sell it to us and getting the Athenaeum. Biggest thing I ever bought was a quarter of a million dollar project at that time in the early 80s. So it was a big deal. Got some uh, news coverage, certainly. And um, you know, it was great. And at that point, 87, 88, I decided that if I was going to be to do colonial early New England stuff all my life, I probably needed to move. 
because uh, I'd pretty much done what you could do, not all of it, but a lot of it at, in Hartford. So I decided, you know, I, this is my home. I had gotten married at this point. I liked it. Uh, we had a house, interestingly enough, that we bought from Jack Bergdorf's cousins up in Enfield. It's, uh, Doris actually put us onto the house we've now lived in and love for 37 years. Um, and I decided to pivot, to get into something else, but to stay here. And that's something else with 19th century Victorian revival. And we wound up acquiring, not acquiring, but doing a very costly restoration of the Goodwin reception room, one of the great rooms I didn't exhibit, called Victorians and Moderns. And at this point, still very interested in gravestones. I went up into the north end of Hartford and discovered Old North Cemetery, which to this day remains one of my great pet passions. It's in one of the poorest neighborhoods in Connecticut, and yet it's that there is no teaching platform. If Wood or anybody ever wants to organize a little tour there, get a group, come down, you'll lose your minds if you've never been. There's so much there, so much history, so much art, beautiful place. And, um, and we organized at the same time this um, Historic Hartford, which is the name of my Facebook site, uh, still very busy, uh, this um, uh, agenda to uh, develop a, uh, a trail. We, we thought of it as the Hartford's answer to the Boston Freedom Trail that would connect all these 19th century treasures, Mark Twain, Harriet Beecher Stowe, the Hudson River School at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, all great stuff. And that led to Twain's world, which was a, you know, today if you were to buy the kind of media support that The Current gave this topic, well, it would cost you half a million dollars probably. Uh, so we got a lot of attention for that. I also, uh, right on the heels of this, uh, launched this project on Sam and Elizabeth Colt. It was an amazing story. In 1986, uh, front page of the Hartford Current, there was a scandal because the curator at the State Museum in the State Library had gotten ripped off. He'd sold millions of dollars worth of guns to some gun collector who traded, didn't buy them, he traded some fakes. <laughs> and it was a real scandal. Millions of dollars of equity destroyed by a bad choice. And the current was calling the Athenaeum. They knew the Athenaeum had a gun collection, and they wanted to know what this, whether that same person had gotten to us. And I was, my boss said, look, I need, by 4 o'clock today, I need to be able to answer the current's question about what is the status of our cult collection. And I, so I spent all day going through the files and looking at everything, because I really hadn't studied this collection. Wasn't a gun person particularly. But at the end of the day, I reported to him. I said, well, all the guns are, everything's intact, except a couple hunting trophies that the colt son had. And they may have gotten mothball eaten or something, but they were gone. But I said, the, the bigger story is not just guns. This is the story of these people's lives. The, the collection is much wider and deeper than guns. So we organized this exhibit, uh, which I loved, in 1996, uh, called Sam and Elizabeth Legend and Legacies of Colt's Empire. And it was almost entirely, we had a few loans, but it was almost entirely from the permanent collection. And the quantity and quality of media support we got from the Hartford Current would be completely inconceivable today, but nonetheless, it really made a difference. And there was an in-gallery video that I produced called Rediscovering the Lost Treasures of Coltsville, which again was emphatically a preservation agenda. What we had in the way of the collection was one thing, but what we also knew was that there were 33 historic buildings associated with the Colt era that were still intact in town, and some of them very much in need of care. Astonishingly, the current getting on board, the political class getting on board, we suddenly wound up, uh, after many years and going through many hoops, with a national park, which is still a work in progress. My goal is to live long enough to see it fully operational, but I think we're getting closer than ever, and it's something I'm very proud of. 
at the end of 97, I had pretty much climbed every mountain I thought I could at the Athenaeum and uh, took on the job of uh, director of the Connecticut Landmarks, as it's known now. I, we changed the name to simplify it. Because we kept getting it was the Antiquarian Landmarks Society, and people thought we were against aquariums. <laughs> Why? What is this anti-aquarium thing? So we knew that we had a, a, a name where the lead word was something people mostly did not understand. So we, we changed it to Connecticut Landmarks. But it's the oldest statewide museum slash preservation group in Connecticut. And they've, we had 23 historic buildings and nine sites and house museums. And it was all good. These are some of them. The Hempstead House, upper left. Isham Terry House in the north end of Hartford. A massive day house, lower right, and the Bellamy Faraday House on top of the Nathan Hale homestead were some of our properties. And, you know, we did a lot with um, uh, programs. I always figure that the key, if you want the public to support what you do, give them a reason to turn out. And so programs were one thing we did. And um, lecture series, and I love, we did these bus tours. Um, what I called the magical history tours. And actually, the last one I led came right here. Uh, it was Enfield, East Windsor, and East Windsor Hill. And God bless Doris. She had a reception at the end of the tour, a little wine and cheese reception down at the town, town farm. And if I would tithed everybody at the end of that reception after a glass of wine, it uh, would have solved all of our financial problems. Because she, everybody loved these these tours, and we, we went to the Shaker comp. We got permission from the prison in Enfield to see the Shaker buildings there. Went to the Shaker Enfield Historical Society, came here. It was great stuff. I love those programs. And uh, every year, we'd have our annual meeting someplace in Connecticut and turn the afternoon into a, a field trip adventure. And you know, it was uh, when John Rowland, Governor Rowland, was in trouble uh, with the law. I felt badly for Waterbury. I thought, poor old Waterbury <laughs> always gets kicked around. Let's do our annual meeting in Waterbury. And we did, and it was wonderful. People, every place in Connecticut has something special to recommend it. So, um, so I'm there for a little while, and then the historic Hartford agenda reemerged as this arts heritage partnership with this fabulous friend and partner, Ken Kahn, then the director of the Greater Hartford Arts Council, and we did this, uh, the first and last ever regional strategic plan for how to move the, the cultural resources of the region to the next level and make Greater Hartford a destination. Uh, and we did some things. It did not ever get completely done. I wound up writing uh, the narrative for the tourism guides for the tourism thing for a couple of years. And, was then, am now, somebody who absolutely believes it's, you know, in the best, as Abbott Cummings once told me, remember, Bill, that even in the best of times, only about 4% of the population could care less about any of this. And I'm thinking, oh, gosh. So even in South Windsor, even here, uh, with this incredible main street, probably most residents of this town don't know why that matters. And, you know, that's the way the world is. So uh, if you're going to make visitation work, you've got to look beyond your immediate residence to make that work. And that's where tourism comes in. And you know, I've written, God, probably 50 op-eds for the Hartford Current over the years and on different things. But tourism is one of my beats. And, and then they sometimes cover stuff. And I got really into North Hartford, and I'm still into it. Uh, and you know, it's the poorest neighborhood, one of them in Connecticut, and there's so much there. And of course, the Landmark Society had a house museum there, so one year we did one of our field trips to the North End, which nobody, no tourists ever go there, but I was trying to make a point. And in 2004, we organized this all day long festival uh, in North Hartford with uh, tours, lectures, performing arts, venues, all kinds of really cool stuff. And 
you know, I wish that had become an annual. It was a really cool thing. I wound up leaving there, and my next and last organizational job was working for the, as the director of the New Haven Museum, which is founded in 1862. It's one of the oldest museums in Connecticut, and we did a lot of stuff there. They also had a house museum in the upper right, the Party Morse House. So getting into all that stuff. And uh, I then became a, uh, after uh, a, a, a turnaround there, which was not easy, but we did it. I uh, spent 10 years doing consulting work, doing projects, and uh, you know, being self-employed. And I kind of liked that best, to be honest. And <laughs> because I run toward disasters, not away from them, um, when the American Association for State and Local History, I mean, there had been this whole insane movement in the early O's to stigmatize the, the biggest and to me most important sector of the whole museum industry, which are historical societies and house museums, most of which are small, most of which are poor, some of which are pretty lousy, but almost all of which have something to offer, and some of which are the greatest museum experiences I've ever had, and I've visited a thousand museums in my life. And when the professional group for the museum industry runs on the cover of their magazine, America doesn't need another house museum. I just, my head exploded, and I became, um, not that we need more of everything, but I would like these same people to tell people what I do every day on my, not every day, but every week certainly, in my Housing Our History Facebook site where I do museum reviews and talk about stuff the press never covered. Um, tell us why these things matter, and if you can't, shut up. <laughs> and again, I just, you know, I, I've been to so many, I love this stuff. And these are Berlin, Connecticut, Keene, New Hampshire, upper left, Berlin, Connecticut, Clockwise, Keene, New Hampshire, Woodstock, Vermont, and Little Falls, New York, that little bank on the lower left I love. And these are all historical societies. And, and some of them, the Litchfield Historical Society in Connecticut, money helps, and the Litchfield Historical Society's got a lot of money, and they do amazing work. But you don't have to have a ton of money to do amazing work. And this is in Waldoboro, Maine. And you know, many of these organizations are volunteer run, and they do stuff that I just takes my breath away sometimes. And they have stuff. Uh, we were, Carolyn and I were just talking about your, the barn door, whatever it is, downstairs of the Indian. That is an incredibly important artifact. And here it is. Of course, you've got a lot of great stuff here at Wood Library. And then this was one of my consulting projects is doing a hopefully a tur full turnaround for the Shaw Hudson House in Plainfield, Massachusetts, the second or third smallest, population 900. This is the earliest, in, it's among many other storylines. First of all, it's a time capsule, which means everything in the house came with the house. No curators collected anything. It's an organic, pure artifact of the past. And that includes, among other things, the earliest intact medical space in the United States, a doctor's office from the 1830s and 40s that is intact and includes, among other things, issue one, volume one of the New England Journal of Medicine. I mean, this guy, Dr. Shaw, was an important figure in medical history. And anyway, it's great stuff. And this is my housing history, is my Facebook site. I talk about the topic, I've written articles about it, and I'm kind of chipping away at a book project I hope I live long enough to see get done. At some point, I was pushing back so hard on the anti-house museum thing that I finally got a call from the Boston Globe, which was what I learned the hard way, is once a bad story gets out there, the, you know, the media picks up on it and they just reiterate it. So this anti-house museum thing had been picked up by a half a dozen newspapers, and nobody had challenged it. So she calls up Ruth Graham at the Boston Globe, 
and interviews me in any way. I didn't probably change the world, but I did go on record uh, affirming as strongly as I can why I think these things matter. You know, I, other things I was involved with was tours and travels and immersion experiences. I wish that project I did in Middlebury in, in the 80s, I tried to replicate this model in other places where you would go to, say, New London or Greater New London and spend two days, a group, uh, drilling down into all the cool stuff that we do. But uh, Mike McGarry, some of you may know who he is. He's a... Uh, uh, he, he came up with the idea. I worked with him on it. Mike McGarry and friends, Christmas Christian Heritage Bus Tours. Who would think you could fill three buses of 45 people, 50 people each, wanting to go see these historic churches in Hartford? But they were amazing, are amazing. And uh, I uh, also organized this African-American Freedom Trail, uh, Freedom Tour of Washington, D.C., where key to life is connecting the dots, and it, most communities don't have, you know, they're not historic Deerfield or Colonial Williamsburg. So the question then becomes, what else you got here that would interest people who came to see your thing? And people don't usually think that way, so it makes it harder. And uh, I'm dying to do a bus tour. I won't even get into it, but Albany and Troy is my new big thing. And nobody ever organized a bus tour to Greenwich. But I did, because Greenwich had been good friends and clients. They were as, having me do things for them. I'd done a 75th anniversary exhibition for the Greenwich Historical. I said, you know, let's show you a little love. So I put together a day in Greenwich that, I mean, it was fabulous. And we loved it. There's, there's stuff everywhere. And I don't know if my legs could handle it, but this was maybe eight years ago. I did bicycle tours, 13-mile bicycle tours, both in New Haven and Hartford, and somebody saw the tour to history and the current, and I get these crybabies whining that I didn't have a helmet on, and it's just like, oh my God, just shoot me, please. <laughs> I'm trying so hard. But we really, the 13 miles of Hartford was amazing. And the graveyard stuff and you know, other things that I was doing with my consulting work, uh, I really loved it, but I'm glad, I'm quasi-retired, I don't really you know, I still do projects, but they're almost all for fun, and I love it. And, you know, again, it's, if there is a crisis or a situation, I tend to run in that direction. So preservation advocacy is a thing. I am trying still. It's been through the General Assembly twice and never got on the floor out of committee for a vote but we're trying to create this industrial history trail. I got very interested in industrial history through Colt. I have a video on my YouTube channel, William Hosley YouTube channel. I have a video about uh, this industrial history trail that gets it down to about seven minutes, you know, what it is, where it is, why it matters. And it, it, I love it, and I think that people, you know, the when those, I'm 67, and people my age or older absolutely do remember when Connecticut made a lot of stuff. When I, my first summer in Hartford, I went to Willimantic, and the American Fred Mill was still people, the whistle would blow, the shifts would get out. Um, that world is pretty much entirely gone, but Connecticut made everything. And the evidence is there, and many of the buildings associated with it have been destroyed or are at risk, so I want to call attention to that. And every little dot on this map represents an industrial site that was part of this, is part of this trail, if we can ever get it out of committee. And if you've got a state senator or state rep that might be interested in this, call me, because we can send them the, you can send them the video and tell them why it matters to you if you agree. Uh, places like Putnam and a lot of these industrial towns in Connecticut are a little worse for wear today, so they need this. The tourism, the sense of self-respect and pride in accomplishment, these were places that were hugely important nationally, and maybe they struggle a little bit today because the industries that created them are gone, but Putnam is one of those places. These are, uh, on the upper left is the Ta Taftville section of Norwich, on the right is uh, Vernon, and on the lower left is Thompson, Connecticut, industrial sites. Uh, this is sad. I was called in to do a documentation of the built mill building on the left 
before it was demolished. And most people don't think of this. They're either embarrassed or ashamed that they're destroying something, so they don't bother even to go inside and take a picture. Well, I did, there's a video on my YouTube channel about this incredible building. I won't spoil the fun, but it's really worth a look. And it, on top of the little red building on the left there that is demolished, the blacksmith shop associated with it is still there, and the Historical Society in New Hartford still hopes to preserve it. I, I don't know what's going on with that, but I helped, tried to help. And then I got involved in Suffield. This is like modernism, which is not really my thing, but this uh, Warren Plattner uh, modernist architect designed library in Suffield was in the crosshairs, and, um, and I, I was part of a group that pushed back on demolishing it and replacing it with a new super-sized library. And I'll never forget going to a town meeting. They had a big meeting about this at the high school in S Suffield. And, um, and I, at one point, st stood up to say something. It, it was 500, 400, 500 people in the audience. And, uh, and, th they, uh, and I said something. Somebody got up and said, who are you? And where are you from? I said, I'm Bill Hosley, and I'm from Enfield. And they said, well, this is a local affair. I said, that's fine, as long as you don't intend to get any state money to help you with this new library project. It's a local affair. But if you're taking state money, it's goddamn well my affair, too. And <laughs> that got a little timid applause from a few people, but in the end, I would like to say we succeeded in stopping the new library, but it was really the financial crisis of 2009 that killed it. But it's still there. And this spawned another pet interest, and Wood Library is part of this program. More than books, libraries, community, and historic preservation. And I have been a close observer of things going on here uh, for 40 years, and it's impressive. It's, it's a library, but it's also a museum and a programming organization, and one of the first libraries in the state that I was ever aware of that was doing this multifaceted job that I think is so important. And I just love historic libraries. I joke about wanting to create a children's book. Uh, I'm not going to write a children's book, but my fa one of my favorite libraries in Connecticut is out in Norfolk. It's so picturesque. And I was there one day, maybe even the day I took these pictures. Norfolk thinks of itself, they call themselves the ice, ice, box. ice box of Connecticut, coldest town in Connecticut. It reminds me of Vermont. And, um, and I was there in the winter and doing something in the library, and it was snowing really hard. And at the end of the day, uh, like six inches of snow had fallen, or seven inches, and it was still coming down like crazy. And it was at that moment I had this fantasy about being trapped in the library overnight <laughs> during a snowstorm, because they've got this, you can barely see it in the right, but the fireplace and with a big roaring fire. And I just thought that was sort of beyond romantic. And anyway, it's a great building. Then I got into trouble with this, I guess. The number one crisis in the preservation field today is the threat to houses of worship everywhere. Now, there are many churches that have plenty of money and endowments and maybe plenty of parishioners, but the va vast majority aren't that well situated, and we're losing houses of worship every year, and in almost every town in America before the Civil War, a church was the most important architecturally, culturally, civically building in those towns. And so we've got a real crisis brewing. What do you do with a church that no longer has a sufficient parish? And I speak on this topic, not that anyone particularly cares, few do, but the people that need to hear it are the, in the faith community. And I have done a few programs, but getting the faith community to, to partner, really, with the heritage community and recognize and to find other ways to multitask, if you will, sources of revenue so that they can sustain these. So then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the oldest church in one of the richest towns in Connecticut, that would be Farmington, decided to sell its liturgical silver, which included a piece of silver that belonged to Thomas Hooker's son, who was also a minister, 
and the minister in Farmington. And forgive me, but they, their purpose in selling this stuff was so they could supersize their parish hall. I can't overstate how absurd both things are. Uh, and uh, so I, I came out about it, wrote an op-ed, um, and you know, it's, these issues are complicated and nobody wants somebody from Enfield <laughs> telling them what to do. So then there was the Alcott House down the street. That was the last time, sadly, that I saw Bor Doris Bergdorf in full flower as the person she always was. And there's Doris on the left and Dean Zarefis on the far left. And a group of us, some of you in the room, were involved in the advocacy and some of you in the room helped save this. It was what I would describe as a situation. The person that bought it wanted to bulldoze it and put a McMansion there. And it, I guess it got stopped. And I think the house is maybe done and ready to be sold. I'm not sure, but it, it's uh, Ed Sunderland and Linda have done an amazing job of uh, uh, restoring it. And it, it's a great, great, important house. Picture in the upper left, I think, was in the archives here at Wood Library and uh, shows what it looked like originally. The picture on the upper right shows what it looked like when it was covered with aluminum siding, and you couldn't really appreciate the beauty of it that well, but the interior was mostly intact, and anyway, it's a great save. And Then I got involved in this out in Thompson, Connecticut, and th this is uh, crazy. This is the Mason House, 1840s, one of the great Gothic Revival, and you have a fabulous one right on the main street here, but Gothic Revival is one of the rarest and most interesting to me styles in the history of architecture. And this house had been bought in, I guess, the late, in the 70s by a guy named Mario Bowada, who was a New York interior designer and who, whose whole thing was hanging out with the moneyed set. And he bought it, I guess, with the idea he was going to restore it or do something with it. And maybe he had a clash with the zoning. I don't know what happened, but he sat on it, and 20 years went by, and it was a demolition by neglect situation where he wouldn't sell and, uh, uh, and wouldn't fix it and wouldn't care for it. And it was right at the heart of the historic district. And that woman on the lower right there, Donna Serrard, Con designed, conducted one of the bravest and most visionary preservation campaigns I have ever witnessed. And she used social media to do it. And she, she got me more involved, others more involved. And that is now a save. But these things don't always work out that way. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm very interested in graveyards. I'm presently involved in a project trying to save the Marble Museum up near Rutland, Vermont. And that's a whole nother topic for another day, but I um, recently did a program about the marble corridor of western New England it stretches all the way from Danbury to practically the Canadian border, and there were all these uh, quarries and marble cutters and stone cutters and sculptors, and it's a largely unreported story, so I'm involved in that. And then this is 19, this is kind of funny, 1984, because I rush in the direction of trouble. Um, the George Eastman House, I happened to grow up in Rochester, New York, before I moved to Vermont. This was the first museum I ever visited twice. And it was across the street where, from the church we attended, and my parents would be at like coffee hour, and I'd be across the street at the George Eastman House Museum of Photography, which uh, was great, and I still love going there. And um, one, a member of the board of trustees decided that, that they didn't have the money to care for everything, that the house was the main thing, and that the photography collection really would be better off in Washington, D.C. with the Smithsonian. And that, with me, is like putting a match to gasoline. And so I sat down and banged out this op-ed, just sort of chastising the city for neglecting this and letting it go, and we won. It became a cause celebrant on the lower left there is a fan letter from one of the staff people saying, God, thank you for saying what we all think. So sometimes the journalism can be your friend. We lost this one, and I did an op-ed on this, the Hitchcock. Did anyone ever see the Hitchcock Museum in Riverton? It was really very good. 
And there is no excuse. When they wound up selling the collection and liquidating it, I mean, it brought like $250,000, like nothing, really. And they, they, anyway, it shouldn't have been lost. And this could have been lost, but it wasn't. I did not bet on that. The Infinity Hall, the Norfolk Opera House, Norfolk, Connecticut again. And uh, this, I was involved in putting, uh, creating a national register district in the North End around the Isham Terry House, the second district, second district uh, school, Keeney Clock Tower, and some other things. And almost before the ink was dry on the National Register appointment, the city bulldozed the signature building at the center of the historic district, which is after promising that their goal was adaptive reuse. So they not only were stupid, they were liars. Oh, God, this got me in trouble. This guy used to be famous. Bob Bishop wrote a book, a collector's guide. He was the founder of the Folk Art Museum in New York City and had a collector's guide where he explained to people how they could collect gravestones. And I jabbed a knife through the heart of that. And then I've talked about George Dudley Seymour. He was a visionary and may do a book on him someday. I've certainly got enough material. He is, was a genius and the greatest friend Connecticut ever had. He died in 1948, but he's very much alive for me. And I got involved, uh, this is complicated because the, my former employer, Connecticut Landmarks, had a, was given a house, I was involved in uh, recruiting it, that they, and, and a pretty decent little endowment, not little, a pretty decent endowment, and they were going to sell the house because they didn't think whatever their position was. And, um, and, and I, I just thought they weren't thinking it through. And so I did some things. And then the, the New London Day had a reporter that jumped on this and just kneecapped it, uh, this, this neglect of these two properties. And look, Connecticut Landmarks, I love it. I'm a member. I support what they do even now. But it's all not all about, it's often about money. And they don't have a lot. And so Nathan Hale Homestead and Phelps Hathaway, a few of their properties, Bellamy Faraday have money, but some of the other properties are poor and I know how hard it is. And then I got involved in this and I won't go into it, but the Berkshire Museum in Pittsfield, another organic, civically originating campaign to save something. Uh, we failed, this one, didn't work out. The Berkshire Museum had decided to save, to sell off its art collection, including famously one of the most important pictures by Norman Rockwell that he donated to them. And, but they had a really great art collection and, and the trustees smelled money and they, some uh, grifter got a hold of them and sold them on some absurd concept of a makeover. I don't, nobody, everybody's not going to agree about everything, but sometimes you need to push back. And we did, but we, we lost. But it created a spirit in the community that I still think is impressive. Public speaking like I'm doing now, I mean, I think of myself as a teacher, uh, and I love going around and sharing the news about things. We're doing a series at the Webb Dean Stevens Museum beginning at the end of this month. I still, I'd love to do bus tours. I haven't done one in a long time, but I did the Civil War treasure troves bus tour for the Connecticut Historical Society, uh, where we went to Middletown, Rockville, Winstead, and Hartford. And uh, you ask, what, what do they have to do with the Civil War? Well, you should have been on that bus, because it was a, an amazing experience. I'm presently involved we're doing something at the Ice and Terry House on the right there on April 23rd. Frederick Law Olmsted in 19, no, 2009, the Atlantic Monthly, the magazine, rounded up 10 <coughs> eminent historians in, to, in, to identify the 100 most influential figures in American history. And Frederick Law Olmsted came in 49th. 
And, you know, in the top 50, you got people like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, you know. And he is a breathtaking epic story. He was born or raised almost across the street, the building's gone, from the Isham Terry House, and he's buried in the North End. And so this is an opportunity to tell some stories and to capitalize on an incredible piece of history uh, uh, that is Hartford-centered. These institutes, I still, I don't know if I got the energy anymore, but, but I've talked to Greater Bennington, Rockingham, and I love the Mohawk Valley. Dean Zarafis and I used to always talk about, he loved going out there to the Mohawk Valley, the area between Amsterdam, New York, and Utica along the Mohawk River. Very historic, very interesting. And these immersive experiences, I just love doing them where you spend a couple days and look at a lot of stuff. Winstead, Naugatuck. I mean, before I left Landmark, uh, the people that were signing up for our bus tours had gotten more and more enthusiastic. And I said, my god, could I do a tour to Bridgeport and still fill a bus? And I never got a chance to test it, but I think we could have. And Bridgeport it gets a bad rap, but it's, there's a lot there. So um, that's. African-American history, very interested in it. There's stuff everywhere. And this is some of my social media stuff. Creating Sense of Place for Connecticut is my Connecticut Facebook site that is just chock-a-block. It's all searchable. So if you went on there or went on Historic Hartford and, and searched for Wood Library, you'd find everything I ever said about this place. Not too many, but there are probably two or three posts. I love what you're doing with the Indian village out back, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all good, and I use social media. Christine and I, as I said, we've spent 100 days on the road looking at gravestones, wrote an article about it, and, um, you know, it's just, we just have a ball, and I'm lucky to have a wife that loves this stuff She's smarter than me, nicer than me, more fun than me, and she likes a lot of the same stuff, so it's kind of a win-win-win. And we, we, we raised two children in the midst of all this, and I still am not sure what they think of their parents. Probably they're great, but uh, they're not really active museum goers, let's put it that way. They probably saw 100 before the age of 10. And uh, that's it, people protect what they love, and you can't love things you don't know, which is why education matters. Then preservation, just to end on a sort of strange note, the Preservation Act of 1966, people in the preservation field think this was the beginning of the preservation movement. It's not the end, it's a good thing, tax credits and all that, but, but it's, it's, it's kind of displaced the spirit that the women in Savannah and Charleston and the DAR and the museums everywhere, you know, you know, uh, why this stuff matters still matters. And, and I'm not sure the national organizations get it. A world without tax credits. And look, you know, with tax credits, but tax credits for adaptive reuse is, is an important thing, and all these mill conversions wouldn't happen without them. <laughs> then I, I get this in the mail the other day. Historic New England is doing a summit, convening leading voices in Worcester to talk about livable, resilient communities. And then they've got the shopping list of all the things that they think are important. And some of that stuff is important, but some of it is nonsense. And they left the most important thing out, which is stewardship, which is what Doris Bergdorf was all about. And it's because of these, you, you know, guess what? We're all born stupid as a brick. You only care about things you learn about. And what are our kids getting in the schools? I don't know. But they, you know, and I, this is another nutty thing. I am a strong proponent of what I call learn local. And the ability to teach the humanities, art, history, language, without leaving this street, ought to just awe teachers in the public schools here, but probably they don't even know it exists. And we got a problem. 
and this is, this is it. Then there's this. I think I'm going to be back. I forget the date. But to do something about clocks, I was so proud of you, uh, uh, everyone here. Uh, Hildred's grandson, sons, uh, inherited Carol's house and stuff. And they don't live here. And uh, personally, I think things should stay where they belong when possible. And I got a call saying, um, you know, I know you know a lot about these antiques. We'd like to keep the stuff local. Can you help us? Anyway, long and short of it, it's the Daniel Burnap clock right around the corner here. Burnap, you got Chapin, you got Burnap, and someday maybe you'll get some really cool thing by Abner Reed. Or maybe even we could put it right on that wall, a big photo blow up reproduction of his incredible 1811 map. I mean, he did a lot of stuff with printing and engraving. But the point is, when I, as an outsider, visit a place like this, I want to see stuff like that here, where it came from. And we're going to be talking about clocks. Thank you for turning out. <laughs> it's never too late to start. And, and you know, I, I didn't, didn't go into this, but I, um, I still pray that the town farm is saved. And I don't know what's going to happen with that. But um, Doris is still with us, but not with us. And she's, I guess, at Kimberly Hall. And, and, um, and I spent years with her uh, talking about it. And I went on tours. And I'll tell you, I mean, this is crazy. But I organized a tour for this group called the Walpole Society, which is a national organization of rich collectors that literally includes some billionaires and nobody who isn't a multimillionaire. They're, these are rich boys. It's a rich boys club. And uh, they came to Hartford for their 100th anniversary in 2009. And architect Jared Edwards and I organized a bus tour. I was asked to help with that. And we, I thought it was great. Jared and I were completely on the same page. What would be if you had one day to show these people the coolest stuff around Hartford? Well, they'd had a dinner at the Athenaeum. And I think they'd gone to the Connecticut. But what can we do? And we organized a day-long bus tour that ended with a wine and cheese reception at the town farm. And I had a, a DuPont, one of them. And what you know, these people, the millionaires and the billionaires, I call them. Just say this being at the town farm and looking at the the floodplain and the acres and the f four, almost 400 years of farmland with a Native American village at, probably at the intersection of the Scantic and the Connecticut River. This was the highlight of our whole trip. And Doris was so cool. It was the only time I ever saw her put on lipstick. I wouldn't have even guessed <laughs> that she owned any. But it was... But she was so great, and she put this on. She was so happy to have people experience what she loved. And most of you know, as a volunteer for years, she had school groups come down. Doris had the most innate instinct for history and preservation and local stuff. You know, the book she did on the street and its architecture. Was she a professional graduate school trained scholar? Of course not. But, but she had the X factor that you cannot get where you need to go any other way if you don't, which is love. And she just loved this stuff. It was her life. and she. So I, I, I hope that will, you know, if I had a magic wand, it would come here uh, and be part of either the historical side or the Wood Library, but whatever. I think it's sustainable, and I think I know how, but... Oh, Watson House? Yeah, what was that? Yeah, that was Hildred Raymond owned that. And um, it's really cool. It's got... It, it, it's... You know, if you went to Salem or Portsmouth, New Hampshire, some of the really posh, rich colonial cities, you m would find some of these three-story mansions. But there aren't any in Connecticut. There may be three, two. I mean, this is one. It's the best one. And it's got, it's, it's what they call a four over four room plan, which means two rooms front, two rooms back, 
but then on three stories, and every one of those rooms has a fireplace. So there are 12 fireplaces <laughs> in that house. And it, it, you know, it, it's a little tough because it's on a, I mean, I think the current owners are doing a very good job with it. But you know, probably most of you know, there was a period where it was for sale for quite a while. And it was, you know, it's, it's sort of on a, I don't think it's a full acre. So, you know, people that, that can afford to live that way or have a big house like that might want a bunch of acreage. And so it's not the easiest thing, but it, it seems pretty safe at the moment. And Hildred loved it. And then at some point it was, you know, sold. And, um, but it's a great, great house. In, in a perfect world, you tax things that are bad and you subsidize things that are good. <laughs> and we do the opposite here. We, we subsidize gambling and, and marijuana, <laughs> and we, we tax you <laughs> uh, when you're preserving something. It's crazy. But nonetheless, uh, you know, there, there really ought to be provisions that help with the stewardship uh, that give a little bit of a tax break to people who are obviously spending more money than they'll ever see out of it. Look, I, I think that sometimes the construction industrial complex, which is what I call it, people who build things for a living, to, forgive me, but to, to them the only good house is the house they're building. Mm -hmm. uh, they want, they, if everything got destroyed tomorrow, if it, was, if it was Ukraine, they'd be thrilled because they'd know there'd be lots of work on the horizon. I mean, it's, it's not quite that bad, but it's pretty bad. You know, in a perfect world, people that are caring for these quasi-public treasures, because if you, if you removed all that from this main street, it's just another homogenous, bland piece of real estate. I mean, what makes this place special is all these historic buildings. And I'm not saying people should get a huge tax break, but a little thank you once in a while might be nice. So if anyone that does and cares, thank you. And, and, and also, you know, this idea that, oh, houses, old houses are a money pit. Well, they don't absolutely have to be. And, you know, I, and I'm not going to trash every new thing that's built, but a lot of houses that were built in the 70s, are, are, and they really almost build things today for maybe a 50-year lifespan before everything needs to be replaced because it was built with garbage materials and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there are no simple answers, but I would call Preservation Connecticut and the state office, and I should know, I'll look it up, what, what, what if any provisions there are for tax abatements for uh, read the kind of investment that's been made in that Alcott house. So, okay, good, thank you. Thank you.